So today we're going to start talking about personality and social psychology, which is one of the most important chapters because of the extremely pervasive and strong influences of social forces on our motivational systems and just shaping our entire lives. And it's almost like this uh, David Foster Wallace uh, graduation speech, this famous thing where he's talking about like fish don't know what water is because it's just so pervasive, so all encompassing. It's the same thing with social forces. We kind of discount the extent to which we're actually shaped by all these social forces because they're so pervasive, so all encompassing. One of the great ways to see this is to look at how pervasive uh, this hero's journey plot structure is throughout the history of storytelling. This is something that Joseph Campbell has really uh, emphasized and picked up on, um, but it goes really goes back to you know ancient Greek uh, stories and biblical stories. Everything has this same kind of structure, and it's really based on the process of an individual finding their way in society at this critical juncture initially as you become an adult, transitioning from the safety of your childhood environment in the family to becoming an actual separate individual in society. And that critical, critical coming of age step where you figure out who are you? What, what group do you belong to? What groups do you belong to? Um, what's your identity? All these really challenging critical questions. And the, the hero's journey is essentially a kind of mythic encapsulation of that whole process. So you start off and you're in your ordinary world and you know everything's fine. And then you get this kind of like something weird happens, this call to adventure, right? Uh, but you're like, no, I don't want to go do that. I'm happy in my little home here. I don't want to have to go out and, and, and challenge myself in this, in this world. I'm very happy and comfortable. But then you can't escape this big event that takes place. So then you cross this point of no return, this threshold, right? Some, some dramatic event happens in our lives. This is when we actually have to really get out and go to junior high school or high school. And then you have to really find out who you really are, right? And so, you know, in the classic example of Star Wars, Luke's parents are killed, right? I mean, so that's very dramatic. Then he really has to figure out, okay, what's going on? Uh, goes to meet the mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, goes through a series of trials and, and this whole process of trials and proving yourself and testing yourself and discovering you know, what your true limitations are and what your true capabilities are, that's this whole process of finding your way in society. And there are so many uh, initiation rituals across different cultures that formalize this process and that, that create traditions and cultures and, and rituals around this whole process. And, you know, this is why adolescence is so difficult but also such an amazing time. It really is a huge period of transformation in your life. And this is what it's all about, is finding out how you as an individual can fit in with the broader uh, world and, and not just be kind of a, a member of a, your family that's been nice and safe and secure this whole time. Ultimately, you have to uh, have this ritualized facing down with your family, so Luke confronting his father, you know, a lot of this kind of Oedipal type of stuff going on. Uh, a lot of it is about, you know, discovering your sexual maturity as well. As well, All these things are happening at this, at this period in your life. So it's, it's really an incredible, uh, crazy time. And, and movies in, in one way or another, even if they're not explicitly about this coming of age story, as you can see, um, they have this same structure and it's always there kind of in this development and character building in the modern era it really all this really is is taking place in the context of uh, junior high and high school middle school and high school this is when this this transition period occurs and it, it really is this kind of crucible and microcosm of what our larger society is about and a lot of the kinds of basic ways of understanding yourself and and your social identity are formed during this critical time period. And I think everybody who's been through this knows, you know, how uh, strong those forces are, right? I mean, you just see 
such a huge drive to fit in and to socialize and to to relate and to connect and and you know really uh, everything becomes about your peer group and people parents you know just are kind of mystified at how strange their kids are now behaving and all this rebellion and all this need for seemingly crazy sort of social status items why does everybody care so much about how popular everybody is right and so what you see so clearly in high school is the importance of popularity and what is popularity uh, why is it so important why does everybody care who's more popular well, it really boils down to this core evolutionary, uh, very important pragmatic force of dominance. Okay, what, who's who's in a leadership position? Who's uh, looked up to versus not? And and what is the kind of ranking of people within some kind of social organization? Ultimately, uh, there's no escaping that fundamental constraint and that fundamental factor. And we'll see this throughout this entire chapter uh, coming up over and over again in different ways, this notion of kind of popularity dominance. There's another dimension, which is kind of, you know, your overall social orientation uh, that gets described in terms of kind of affiliation or warmth. It's always we like to see these kind of simple organizations along two dimensions, these kind of circumplex models, um, two dimensional models. Uh, and here we see competence along one dimension, okay? And there's actually many underlying uh, factors uh, along which one can be evaluated in terms of competence uh, versus warmth. And this is something that Susan Fisk uh, and Amy Cuddy have developed here. Um, and you can uh, derive these kinds of dimensions from thinking about different types of stereotypes, which is what Susan Fisk originally derived them from. Uh, but here we can, we can put different uh, people in the classic kind of high school social identity organization into these different dimensions. So uh, you've got the popular prep kind of people who are high, viewed as generally high in competence in one way or another, and also high in this kind of warmth dimension, which is again, this kind of affiliation tendency to fit in with other people uh, and be part of kind of the quote unquote in group. You have like the jocks who are also viewed as kind of, you know, high competence, but maybe not quite as warm. Uh, geeks also competent on the intellectual dimension, uh, but maybe not so much on the social dimension. Um, generally, maybe sort of more of a warm uh, feeling, especially nowadays for geeks, but maybe not as high as the really popular crowd. Uh, mean girls are uh, another subset of, you know, particularly perhaps popular um, but maybe not so warm, obviously, uh, individuals, uh, you have over here kind of in the low side, kind of these more like outsider drifter loser type of groups, um, who are viewed in low, low in competence, low in, uh, this kind of warmth affiliation dimension. Um, maybe you have, uh, other people who are viewed more warmly, but not so high in competence kind of uh, stoners, affable jokers, you know, kind of random people like that. Um, so, you know, really fundamentally high school, uh, this kind of, you know, categorization of yourself into these different types of categories. Here we have mean girl, geek, you know, stoner, jock, uh, and I think she's kind of an outsider. Um, uh, so there's these, these really strong forces, and we see this again across every different uh, high school across the country. And maybe this is more strongly seen in the United States uh, relative to other countries, but perhaps we also see these similar kinds of uh, social identity formation uh, groups in other cultures as well. But it's very much been a, a, a popular topic in Hollywood movies, capturing that whole uh, uh, seeking of identity and sorting of social identity that takes place during adolescence. And so this is your own individual journey, your own individual hero's journey, finding yourself and sorting yourself into these different groups. And it just all goes back to these core evolutionarily driven social organizational kinds of structures that we've inherited uh, from our, you know, when we were apes and, and you see it today in other ape social structures, 
there's always a clear dominant structure. Franz de Waal uh, documented this in his famous book on uh, chimpanzee politics. Uh, and that's actually where the term alpha male, we started talking about that uh, as a result of this work uh, becoming incorporated into our popular culture. So this is not something that you know is a surprise or is new, but it, it really is uh, striking in some ways how much you know, it's just a, a kind of accepted fact that that our social organization is based on these very kind of, you know, core animal level uh, social structures, uh, fundamentally all about this kind of dominance hierarchy. Uh, so in, in wolf packs, of course, you have a very strong top dog alpha uh, uh, leader kind of role for the, the leaders of the pack. And, you know, when you think about it at the animal level, uh, it's really clear that you need to have these kinds of dominance hierarchies in order to function appropriately. You can't have like 10 different leaders in a wolf pack, right? Um, the wolf pack has to work together and function together in order to survive. Um, and we see this in our military organizations most strongly. There you have an absolute well-defined dominance hierarchy rank uh, is everything and you never, you know, second guess your superior um, and you need that chain of command, that that very clear chain of command in order for the system to function effectively in the real world. OK, and so when things need to function and you need organization, you need coordination, this kind of hierarchy is absolutely essential. OK, and so we can see why evolutionarily these things have developed. And I think what's interesting is the extent to which these same kinds of dominance hierarchies have, you know, still pervade things like high school, where there's really no point to high school in terms of having a social dominance hierarchy. There's really no point. But it's so baked into our brain stems. It's so baked into the, our overall orientation and how we understand ourselves in our as individuals within this larger society that again, it's like water. We don't really even recognize the extent to which we're just following these ancient norms, these ancient programs that are baked into our braid stems that, that cause us to view everything through this lens of popularity or, or dominance and, and chain of command and, and rank and all these other kind of constructs. This also feeds into understanding uh, personality dimensions, our personality dimensions, how we identify kind of our individual, you know, unique characteristics uh, have a lot to do with the same kind of overall st social structure. Uh, these dimensions of kind of warmth or affiliation with different people in our in our kind of in groups, um, and the extent to which we kind of are at a higher level, a kind of extroverted or a dominant uh, kind of role in in society versus not.